Hello, welcome back to our talk on abortion. And the last video you should have seen was why I believe, and specifically the church I lead, believes that life begins at conception. And so I hope that as if you're a Christian watching this, then this helps strengthen your view. Or maybe if you are anti, or excuse me, pro-abortion and you hated everything I said, I hope that you at least took some things into consideration and realized, you know what, I can't just process this however I want. I have to take the full scope of things into consideration. And so uh, we're going to take a look at some common arguments uh, for abortion today and why, in my opinion, and I think truthfully, I don't even want to say opinion, I think they just logically do not make sense. And so uh, we're going to take a look at some of these. And I want to start again by saying we need Christians who are loving, who are caring, who are gracious, but who speak truth while adding a little bit of that salt, you know, like that salt bay back in the day. We, we need Christians who are able to do this. And so uh, if this knowledge puffs you up uh, and doesn't cause you to love more, then uh I think either I'm communicating it wrong or you're hearing it to just turn, you're going to use information to just turn into a stone to start throwing at people. And we can't do that. We have to be Christians who take information that, that sparks us to love and to care and speak truth and love. That's what in this information should be doing. And I hope I'm communicating it that way. But some com common arguments for uh, abortion or why abortion is a good thing. Some people will say this. You know, uh, you're not pro-life, you are only pro-birth. Because you don't care, like people say from the womb to the tomb, you don't care about them when they're born, you just care that they're born. So you're not pro-life, you're pro-birth. And usually people would equate this to like cert, like Christians or people need to vote for certain laws. It's a voting thing ultimately, like you need to vote this way if you really want to be pro-life, that gives money to wait everybody, whatever. We're not going to get into that. But this idea that, hey, you're only pro-birth, you're not pro-life because you don't care about this person uh, after they are born. And it's interesting, you got to take this, because the people who are saying you're only pro-birth are also admitting that, hey, this is a life that needs help, right? So it's just a funny thing to take into consideration. But anyways, um, I believe this argument to be sensationalism at best. Remember, saying things and spouting information at the expense of truth, it's sensationalism. You're not pro-life, you're only pro-birth. And so uh, the idea is that babies who aren't going to grow up in good environments or if they're poor or we don't know what their living situation is going to be, so it's actually better to abort them. That's kind of the argument. And so what we have to understand, and I love this, I forget the name of the pastor who said it. I'll put... I'll put in the description, hopefully, if we remember. But um, he says this. We have to understand this. There is a difference between life and death issues and quality of life issues. We have to separate them. And so this idea that you're pro-birth, they're, they're equating life and death issues with quality of life issues. They're saying they're one and the same. And you got to let that sink in, that there's a difference, though, between life and death issues and quality of life issues. And so I want to give you a hypothetical because if they are one in the same, if uh, life and death issues are one in the same as quality of life issues, let me give you a hypothetical of how this turns out. Let's say you're at the beach and for whatever reason, there's not many people there or what's go or whatever, but you see, you take a look out into the water and you see that there's a child who's barely keeping their head above water and they're drowning. And, and they're, you could hear through the waves and through like, the gas for air, like help. And so in this moment, if quality of life issues and life and death issues are one and the same, uh, we have to uh, take into consideration, well, if I save this child, am I actually helping them by keeping them alive? Because what if their quality of life is not good at all? What if they don't live in a good home? Or what if they, they live in a, a family that's poor? or who doesn't have health care, or, or any of those things, right? So if they're one and the same, I have to take all of these things into consideration in this moment. But does that happen? I, I, if you're a sensible and, and pro person, rational person who sees some, a kid drowning, I would hope that you don't even think about any of that. 
and you just run out. That's what happens. You see something, you see an issue, you see somebody's life in danger, and you run out and you save them. You run out like it's Baywatch, you know, you're ready to go. And that's what happens in that moment. You don't stop to consider, well, quality of life. Is it better if they actually die uh, because they might be poor? I don't know their situation. I don't know what they're going to grow up and go. What if they go through trauma in the future? Uh, am I saving them if I actually let them drown? You know, because that's what happens. And that's the reasoning that goes on when you say that quality of life issues are one and the same as life and death issues. Life and death issues are not the same as quality of life issues. When there's a life and death issue, you react, you respond immediately. You don't take any of those things into consideration before. And because we believe that life begins at conception, that's why we respond. That's why uh, we react. That's why we, we act, right? And that's why we, we believe, hey, this is a life we need to respond. And so, again, with this hypothetical situation, when you save this person, people start to gather and the mom shows up and they're all super celebratory and they're thankful. Thank you that you were there. Oh my gosh, you saved their life. And if life and death and quality of life are the same, here's, here's what comes of it. Somebody, say everybody's celebra celebrating and then somebody comes up to you after you save the child and they're like, well, are you going to pay for their college? Um, are you going to buy their groceries though? Because they live in a poor home. So uh, you're just, you're not really pro-life. Just because you save them doesn't mean anything. And obviously nobody says that in that moment. Nobody would say that in that moment. But again, that's what happens when people try to equate quality of life issues with life and death issues. Nobody says that in that moment. And I want you to hear me out first and foremost. Because what I'm not saying is, especially to Christians who are listening, what I am not saying at all is, or what I'm not trying to do is trying to reason and rationalize our way out of helping people on this earth today. I'm not trying, like the Bible says to care for the widows and the orphans, you know, to count others as more uh, important than you and seek the good of others and seek the good of other people around you and, and love and forgive and care for and give to those who are needy and all of those things. So I'm, what I'm not saying is like, yeah, I'm trying to reason myself out of helping people. Christians should step up. Christians should be the first to say like, you know, I'm going to respond, but I'm also going to care in my everyday life. You know, I'm going to do everything however this idea that we're only pro-birth is silly because I want to say this as well. This is a truth that might be hard to swallow, but Christians, specifically in our country, the U.S., are the most generous people. I think they're twice as likely to adopt. I'll find all the studies and put them in the description again, but we're the most generous. We're more likely to adopt. We're more likely to give of our time, finances, and those things. And so Christians in general are very generous and caring people. That doesn't mean we're perfect. That doesn't mean, yeah, we got it going on. That just means, hey, we're doing good. Now let's do even better. You know, that's, that's the Christian life. Seek the benefit of others. And so... What's interesting is people try to create this false dichotomy uh, in these situations, right? They think like, well, either Christians have to step up and do a thousand times more or abortion should be okay. But you, if, if you notice, there's never, like it's a false dichotomy. It's either everything has to be perfect or abortion uh, is okay. That's a false dichotomy that people, without realizing it, because I don't think these people are truly evil and what I think they're confused, but people try to create this false dichotomy. And if you notice, nobody ever makes mention of, well, what if we all, Christian and non Christian, what if we all decided to step up? What if we all committed to adopting a child? What if we all committed to donating our time and our money to organizations that help pregnant women, single mothers, widowed mothers, that, that help all of these people? But you notice it's always, well, Christians don't even care. But again, statistics show that Christians care very much. We can care more and do more, of course, always. It's not, I want you to hear me on this. But I think it takes a unified effort of people to all admit like, hey, you know what? I need to do more too. I need to give more. I need to step up more. And Christians, if, if you're listening to this, that means you. 
If, if, if abortion is something that you're very passionate about, then I would encourage you, donate to organizations. There's like Corona Life Services, there's Riverside Life Services, there's all of these things. And as a church, we're putting resources like this together. Um, but see how you can be a part of uh, the change. See how you can be a part of speaking truth and love and see how you can be a part of caring for people and caring for mothers and caring for the single, for the widows and whatnot. And so uh, I, I want us to understand that there's a difference between quality of life issues and life and death issues. And it's not rocket science for us Christians to understand that, yes, we can always step up and yes, we can always. But I, what I refuse to believe is that all these Christians are just hateful non unhelp or excuse me hateful unhelping people who don't care about babies or who don't care about mothers or who don't care about anything i i don't buy into that and, and the data actually disproves that and so we have to understand that it's like okay if, if this is what we're passionate about we'll give resources we'll give time and so on and so forth i don't want to um overdo it but you guys get what i'm saying and something about this idea of pro-birth that kind of goes hand to hand is this idea of oh you're forcing people to give birth you're forcing them to do this as if they never had any choice or any chance to even not do it and here's the thing we believe that people have choices we as a christian i believe people have choices however uh, we know what happens when a male and a female engage in unprotected unprotected sex and i want to say even in one year the cdc or somebody said uh, some organizations showed that I believe almost 50% of abortions came from people who were even using contraception, right? So essentially, I, I don't even want to say if you use that, then it's going to work or anything. Anyways, when a male and a female join together, have sex, a child is more than likely to be produced. And so they have a choice in that moment, right? And um, not many people like me for saying this and not probably not many people would enjoy me saying this but however and I hate to use such a silly illustration uh, for such a sensitive thing but when you stick a quarter in a gumball machine a gumball is going to come out you know and so the same thing they do have a choice however that choice was when they engage in that sexual act and now they're maybe uh, are pregnant and they didn't want that to happen. However, life is full of us making decisions and maybe uh, something is produced or comes out of that that we don't want or necessarily enjoy, but our job isn't to run from that or to turn from it. That creates an unhealthy culture in all areas of life, but instead, sometimes we have to deal with the repercussions and that's just how life is. I cannot just run from every problem or situation I create. And so it's not forced birth, there was a choice, and it began in that sexual act. And so these are some of the more com common arguments that I'm hearing today, and we're gonna look at more in the next video, but I wanna give you guys a break to just sit and process everything that was talked about.